old school point and click adventure games. Oh yeah, from my gaming experience this is pretty much the most classic type of electronic entertainment possible. While obviously there were tens, if not hundreds, of awesome games released before and after the period of their undisputed supremacy and the genre itself went through numerous perturbations during the years, classic adventures to this day remain, for me at least, the absolute foundation of interactive storytelling and the very reason why I decided to spend so much of my time with games in the first place. This video is intended as kind of homage paid to the designers and story writers of the times of yore, as well as it is an invitation, an invitation to a trip down the proverbial memory lane to revisit one of the classics from the past of electronic entertainment. So sit back, relax and enjoy. Perhaps you may learn something new, maybe you will be reminded of something long forgotten, and maybe, just maybe, you will get hit by a streetcar named Nostalgia. Hey, I'm Magic. Welcome to Joints and Games. Part 1. Context. Let's cut to year 1993. Adventure games are in the peak of their popularity and the market is literally brimming with new releases. Developer Seiyan finishes work on the first of many missed games, AdventureSoft gives us the first Simon the Sorcerer game, while Westwood Studios released the second of their Kurandia games. Other developers and publishers are also very busy. The French studio slash publisher Infogrames delves into the unspeakable with the Cthulhu mythos inspired Shadow of the Comet. Their brethren at Cocktail Vision finally get to round up their Goblins trilogy and Infocom, aided by the omnipresent publisher Activision, introduces new technical standards with Return to Zork. Hell. Even companies like Virgin Entertainment and Psygnosis are still in the business, with the former publishing the jaw-dropping seventh guest, and the latter innocent until caught. Obviously, all of this seems almost insignificant when compared to the legendary clash of the two planet-sized juggernauts of the adventure games world. Yes, LucasArts and Sierra Online, or Sierra Online and LucasArts, if you prefer. Back in the day, both companies were the absolute top class in the business, and titles released by any of the two were guaranteed to be extremely solid at the very least. While the publishers weren't directly competing against each other, they were both undisputed trendsetters in the industry of the early 90s. There is no point in going through release lists of both contenders. It should be sufficient to say that in only 1993, LucasArts had given us such classics as the Day of the Tentacle, designed by Tim Schafer himself and Sam and Max Hit the Road, a title that many years later got into the hands of the makers of the Walking Dead video game series Telltale Games. Sierra, on the other hand, was at that time into somewhat darker stuff. Sure, the year 1993 saw the releases of the comedic Space Quest V, as well as the sixth, although actually the fifth, adventure of the unfortunate Larry Laffer titled Shape Up or Slip Out, but 1993 is also the year when Jane Jensen finished the first installment in the creepy Gabriel Knight series, The Sins of the Fathers, and when the Police Quest series took a turn into doom and gloom with the almost controversial open season. But, as they say, you can spell slaughter without laughter, so enter the topic of our meeting. It is almost difficult to point out any other title that would mix gothic horror with goofy comedy more seamlessly than the fourth installment in the Quest for Glory series, Shadows of Darkness. Hell, even the title appears to be mocking and one can only be happy that back in 1993 linguistic localizations of newly released games were not a standard practice. I mean, can you imagine all those painful, awkward and genuinely wrong translations of this title? Seriously, Shadows of Darkness, really? What the hell were they smoking at Sierra's marketing department? <sighs> anyway. Quest for Glory is a series of adventure games with a twist, released by Sierra Online between 1989 and 1998. Of course, during these almost 20 years, Sierra has changed a lot, and so did Quest for Glory. Starting in the innocent days of EGA graphics, the first installment released, if you recall, in 1989, combined basic graphics with the necessity of manually typing in commands like, for example, drink ale, search body, or climb wall. This was tedious to say the least, but we really didn't know any better back then. Also, 
While the production values were rather limited, it quickly proved to be just enough to spark the imagination of thousands of gamers. Before anyone knew, a series was born. It is worth noting that the first part of Quest for Glory, titled So You Wanna Be a Hero, was remade in 1991 with the new SCI engine, Sierra's Creative Interpreter version 1.1, in order to fit in line with the style of their more modern titles. But that's a topic for a whole different story. Through the years, the numerous installments in the Quest for Glory series took players for wild adventures set in the land of Gloriana, a place visibly inspired by fairy tales, legends, myths and popular media. So You Want to Be a Hero took place in the mid-European, medieval-like village of Spielburg, in a land threatened by the vile Baba Yaga. The sequel, Trial by Fire, moved things to the desert land of Shapir and focused on Arabic mythology. Actually, Trial by Fire even got a remake in 2008, thanks to the fine folks at HD Interactive. I say you should give it a try. I mean, it's free and your rig will be able to run it without problems. Anyway, the third part of Quest for Glory, Wages of War, was set in the Africa-inspired land of Tarna and tackled motifs from the folklore of countries like Egypt or Kenya. The fourth part, the one I want to focus on the most, turned out as somewhat of a revisioning of the original Quest for Glory, set in a similar, seemingly European valley haunted by an evil force Shadows of Darkness from the get-go seem to be a darker, slightly more mature adaptation of So You Want To Be A Hero. This might have been caused by the fact that while So You Want To Be A Hero drew inspiration from German folklore, Shadows of Darkness is heavily soaked in Slavic tales, which have always been known as the bloodiest and creepiest stories in all Europe. And yeah, there was also the fifth part of the Quest For Glory series, one inspired by ancient Greek mythology but it was already made in different times when Sierra was futilely looking for its own identity and, as far as I'm concerned, a game titled Dragonfire was never made. It's a little bit like with the Indiana Jones movies trilogy. I mean, do you remember this movie? Yeah, me neither. It simply doesn't exist. The series followed the deeds of a hero. Yeah, a bit like in Fable, but many years earlier. The hero being a graduate of the famous Adventurer's Correspondence School, would take on numerous quests characteristic of his profession, from saving damsels in distress, through slaying monsters, to lifting ancient curses. Some of these puzzles would require swift hands and badass combat skills, while others focus more on using items in the right way or even navigating through perilous dialogue options. The gameplay ideas featured in the series were varied and often surprising, and they have borrowed as heavily from adventure game standards as they drew inspiration from classic role-playing games. While the setting and atmosphere of Quest for Glory games change with each installment, one thing remained gloriously the same. This is also the twist that has been mentioned earlier. Quest for Glory was always about a clever mix of a classic point-and-click adventure game with RPG elements like developing one's character through building statistics, which in turn was happening through quest solving, training and slaying enemies. The player would usually choose from three character classes, a fighter, a thief and a wizard, which influenced not only the way the enemies were dealt with, but also the way certain puzzles could be approached. For example, when facing a locked door, a thief would probably go for some lockpicking, the wizard would cast a specific unlocking spell, while the fighter would knock the set door over and kill everyone behind them. Also, with every Quest for Glory game set in, technically speaking, an open world, well, a world consisting of almost static screens loosely sewn together in an editor, but still, the choice of character class would influence the random mini-scenarios and even more random encounters throughout one's adventures. While when judging by today's standards this might seem like not a lot, rest assured that this variety proved, and still does, to be just enough to guarantee decent replay value. However, you see, there's even more to that. With each completed installment in the series, the player could save their character and use it in the next game, while keeping their experience and even some of the inventory items and equipment. Mass Effect, eat your heart out. This was quite groundbreaking for its time and gave a hell of a lot of satisfaction. Also, through importing an experienced character, the player could 
gain access to the toughest of classes, the Paladin. Of course, obtaining that rank required going an extra mile in terms of completing side quests and such, but given the somewhat punishing nature of video games of the early 90s in general, it was well worth the hassle. But enough technicalities for one chapter. Let's focus on Shadows of Darkness. While all the features that have just been mentioned do heavily appear in the fourth part of Quest for Glory, it's not them that make this game unique. What makes this game unique is how awesomely everything fits together. It just fucking clicks, man. Part 2. Case and Point Shadows of Darkness was originally released in 1993, in a time when the Quest for Glory series was already well established in the market and in the hearts of gamers. Sierra had all the incentive to play this one out safely and remain in the Egyptian slash African setting that gamers have enjoyed for the last two installments. Instead, however, they went with the original idea of the designers of the series, Lorien and Corey Cole, and moved things fast familiar, comfortable zones. For the time, this was a very interesting twist, as the series, and Sierra itself, hadn't really ventured into such bloody territories before. When talking about Shadows of Darkness in 1992, during an interview for Interaction magazine, Lorien was noted to say, You'll be very much alone. In Trial by Fire, you had a lot of friends to help you. You always had a place to go back to rest. You always had a place of safety until the very end of the game. Once you get into Shadows of Darkness, you're not going to have any sanctuary. You won't be able to trust anyone, because nobody will trust you. Before moving on, let's share here, as a curiosity of sorts, some additional information about the release of Shadows of Darkness. You see, the first version came on 9 hole 3.5 inch floppy disks. A solution with this one little drawback that floppy disks had this bitch-ass habit of internally disintegrating at random before any prior notice. You should remember that all this was happening during this weird, awkward time when the industry was making the switch from floppy disks to CD-ROMs and it was still years before internet would appear in pretty much every household. Shadows of Darkness was not only available on a less than certain carrier, but it also had its share of bugs. Bugs that with a bit of bad luck could prevent one from even finishing their adventure. It comes as no wonder that already a year after its original release, Shadows of Darkness stormed the market again, this time however on a shiny laser disc. Many of the original bugs were removed, some new ones appeared, but the most important thing is that the CD-ROM version featured additional animations, new sound effects and, brace yourself for that, digitized speech for all dialogues and narration. We will get back to this later. Currently, the CD-ROM edition of Quest for Glory Shadows of Darkness is considered to be the ultimate version of the game. This is also the one available in digital stores like GOG.com. Even though the story of Shadows of Darkness closely followed the events from the previous entries in the series, every episode of Quest for Glory has always been independent enough that one could play them separately, without knowing explicitly what happened to the hero earlier. The new setting was the Valley of Mordavia, a place visibly inspired by tales of vampires, werewolves and ancient curses, but also by classic horror movies like the ones released in the 60s and 70s by Hammer Film and Amicus Productions. Hell, straight from the beginning, the game features numerous references to the elder god Cthulhu, mockingly portrayed in Shadows of Darkness as Avuzlu, the Dark One, and even to the author of Elder God's Mythos, H.P. Lovecraft. Just look at this name. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Or the previous one for that matter. And speaking of inspirations from pop culture, it is difficult to not point out how familiar certain characters look. I mean, look at this disfigured freak. Just look at him. Oh, you found my secret passageway. You must excuse me, I, I'm not quite... Doesn't he bear a haunting resemblance to the amazing Peter Lorre? Or this dude right here? Welcome to Mordavia. Is it only me, or does he totally look like the one and only Boris Karloff from his later years? But I am getting sidetracked. Again. As I said, Mordavia was one sinister place, as the hero would quickly find out. After waking up in a sinister cave taken straight from a Lovecraftian novel, the land has been cursed and the only village in the area was being plagued 
by numerous troubles. Without spoiling too much of the story, let's just say that the adventure would take our brave protagonist from such classic tasks as helping the ghost of a drowned hot woman through numerous encounters with more or less bloodthirsty beasts of various sorts to solving an age-long mystery involving vampires, werewolves and whatnot. Hours of fun, man. As already said, the story in Shadows of Darkness borrows a lot from Slavic fairy tales and legends, and people familiar with the folklore of this region will probably appreciate the appearances of such characters like the Rusalka, Baba Yaga or Chernobog, a Slavic pagan god who throughout the years was featured in numerous video games including the infamous Blood series. The greatest thing about it all, however, is the way that all the different threads are seamlessly mixed together. The experience feels somewhat like a mix of movies like Nosferatu and the Fearless Vampire Hunters with a healthy dash of cheesy humor, daring puns and almost painful word plays. Sierra games have always been known for their specific humor and easter eggs. Some could even say that the Quest for Glory series, and Shadows of Darkness in particular, excel in this aspect. The game is absolutely full of tongue-in-cheek descriptions, deliberately cheesy wordplays and other ways of breaking the proverbial fourth wall of the experience. I mean, just look at that. The cats may explode if you touch them. They're perfectly content where they are. Ooh. This somewhat slapstick atmosphere was achieved not only through clever writing, but also thanks to the involvement of greatly experienced voice-over actors. For example, all the narration, yeah, most, if not all, Sierra's games of that time featured a narrator, was done by John Rice Davis, the son of Gloin. According to an article in Interaction magazine, his part took more than three weeks to record, causing him to refer to Shadows of Darkness as to the CD-ROM from Hell. Another big part, the one of the enticing yet dangerous Katrina. You are alive! Only one person has ever walked away! It's played by Jennifer Hale, whom we all know from such roles as Dr. Naomi Hunter from MGS4, Guns of the Patriots, Leah from Diablo 3, and, last but not least, female Commander Shepard from the Mass Effect series. The lines of Dmitry Ivanov, the Burgomeister of the village, why are you here? Are delivered by Greg Berger, the same who voiced the pain in MGS3 Snake Eater and the badass Grimlock in the latest Transformers game. The list of names goes on and on, and while listening to the dialogue of Shadows of Darkness, one can clearly tell that the actors have put a lot of heart into their work. Hell, at times it even sounds like they're having fun. I don't remember asking. However, as with every game drenched in RPG elements, Shadows of Darkness wasn't only about clever conversations and puzzle solving. Serious combat was an integral part of the experience. With a full day to night cycle, the Valley of Mordavia had its share of perils, dangers and other things that bear avoiding, while the bestiary of Quest for Glory series always appeared as, like other RPG elements featured in the cycle, somewhat limited when compared to such role-playing behemoths as Eye of the Beholder, Dungeon Master or Ravenloft, it comes without a doubt that the enemies featured in Shadows of Darkness were cool enough to be killed. The pixelated silhouettes might not impress today, and honestly speaking they did not exactly impress back in the day either, but they definitely have a lot of unique character. The mage, the thief or the fighter would face such imposing opponents as, among others, shambling zombies, venomous spider bats, nicely animated necrotaurs, the ghost of Lygia herself, no seriously, and even bloodthirsty fluffy white rabbits. combat, it is worth noting that, for the first time in the series, the players would choose between two different approaches to dealing with foes. While the one labeled Arcade is rather self-explanatory, 
the strategic mode would allow the player to skip the hassle of real-time combat and let the stats do all the work. This was, without a doubt, a nice attempt on the designer's behalf to make Quest for Glory more accessible. Also, it has to be said that Shadows of Darkness, as one of the first games in the genre, featured an autosave function, which, given how often one could die in the world of Gloriana, was a welcome addition back then and is even more welcome nowadays when you have all grown lazy in our gaming habits. Ho! Oh! At the time the game originally hit the market, its graphics were quite astounding and truth be told, they still stand tall today in all their 32-bit glory and all their 32-bit horror. Shadows of Darkness was designed to run on Sierra's proprietary SCI2 engine, the same workhorse that fueled such awesome-looking classics as the aforementioned Gabriel Knight, Sins of the Fathers, Police Quest, Open Season, Space Quest 6, The Spinal Frontier, and, almost unbelievably, The Beast Within and the first Phantasmagoria game. You know, the only good Phantasmagoria game? Anyway. The hand-drawn background, still impressed today with their numerous details and somewhat exotic Slavic feel, the character portraits are unique and emphasize distinct features of their owners, and the animations are quite fluent and <coughs> realistic even by modern standards. We have already talked about the impressive voice acting of the story, but in terms of broadly understood audio, what should totally be mentioned is the music composed by Aubrey Hodges, the guy who, many years later, became the director of audio at 38 Studios, a currently defunct company known mostly for the Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning game. Anyway man, this is MIDI at its best, and some of the tracks are awesome enough to be put in line with teams of Hell, the original Doom. Yeah, you heard me, they are that good. So yeah, there you have it. I wanted to talk exclusively about Shadows of Darkness, but in the end it turned out to be impossible to not mention a lot of the context surrounding the game. I obviously don't know about you, but for me, that's the whole beauty of it. We start at one point and plan to go down a certain route, only to find ourselves within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. Or uh, something like that, I don't really know. I hope you enjoyed this little revisiting of an all-time classic and that my train of thoughts has turned out to be bearable. Of course, all that you have just heard is merely uh, my humble opinion, and I probably don't know shit from shit, so, uh, you know, just take it for what it's worth. One way or another though, thank you very much for watching, and don't let the motherfuckers ruin your day. This is Magic, signing out.